Okay, welcome to the Chapter 5 Guided Readings video. In Chapter 5, we are looking at three different things for the annotations. One, we're looking at conflict in the chapter. So with um, any text, you're looking at two different types of conflict, whether it's an internal conflict, meaning a conflict within the character, or an external conflict. So maybe the character versus nature, maybe the character versus another character. So we're looking at what type of conflict is present in Chapter 5 and what is the specific conflict. With this conflict, what does this tell us about this character or characters or the plot? The second thing that we're looking at in Chapter 5 is foreshadowing. So when you see something and you make a connection with maybe something you um, read in a previous chapter, that may help you understand where the foreshadowing comes in. And then you can see where you should have seen this coming from. And then that will also lead you to other examples of foreshadowing in previous chapters as well. The last thing that we're looking for in chapter five is we're going to start exploring themes of the text. So when you're annotating, think about what are some possible themes of the text. And in order to do that, I want you to think about the different topics that we've covered, whether it's in other annotations or in class discussions. Okay, for this annotation, uh, for this guided reading video, I'm actually going to be going off of a, uh, an online PDF version. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I left my book um, on my desk this weekend. Okay, starting with Chapter 5 in Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. On one end of the great barn was piled high with new hay, and over the pile hung the four-taloned Jackson Fork suspended from its pulley. The hay came down like a mountain slope to the other end of the barn, and there was a level place as yet unfilled with the new crop. At the sides the feeding racks were visible, and between the slats the heads of horses could be seen. It was Sunday afternoon. The resting horses nibbled the remaining wisp of hay, and they stamped their feet and they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. The afternoon sun sliced in through the cracks of the barn walls and lay in bright lines on the hay. There was the buzz of flies in the air, the lazy afternoon humming. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. This is not in the annotation list, but it is something that I recognize from chapter four. If you look at the line about um, the horses, okay, they bit the wood of the mangers and rattled the halter chains. That line is a, a, is a repeated line from chapter four. So what I would do is look up what is the significance, okay? When a horse rattles their halter chains, what could that mean? What does that look like? What, so I would pursue that line further to see what could the meaning of that be in this text. Okay, let's continue. From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the playing peg and the shouts of men playing, encouraging, jeering. But in the barn, it was quiet and humming and lazy and warm. Only Lenny was in the barn and Lenny sat in the hay beside a packing case, beside a packing case under a manger in the end of the barn that had not been filled with hay. Lenny sat in the hay and looked at a little dead puppy that lay in front of him. Lenny looked at it for a long time, and then he put out his huge hand and stroked it, stroked it clear from one end to the other. And Lenny said softly to the puppy, Why do you gotta get killed? You ain't so little as mice. I didn't bounce you hard. He bent the pup's head up and looked in its face, and he said to it, now maybe George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits if he finds out you got killed. He scooped a little hollow and laid the puppy in it and covered it over with hay, out of sight. But he continued to stare at the mound he had made. He said, this ain't no bad thing, like I gotta go hide in the brush. Oh, no, this ain't. I'll tell George I found it dead. He unburied the puppy and inspected it, and he stroked it from ears to tail. He went on sorrowfully, but he'll know. George always knows. He'll say, you done it. Don't try to put nothing over on me. And he'll say, now just for that, you don't get to tend no rabbits. Suddenly, his anger rose. Gosh darn you, 
he cried. Why do you gotta get killed? You ain't so little as mice. He picked up the pup and hurled it from him. He turned his back on it. He sat bent over his knees and he whispered, Now I won't get to tend the rabbits. Now he won't let me. He rocked himself back and forth in his sorrow. Okay, what type of conflict do we have here with this conversation that Lenny is having with himself? So when we look at conflict, okay, what type of conflict is this? Is this internal or external? And then what is the conflict exactly? Okay, let's continue. So I would make those annotations, okay? From outside came the clang of horseshoes on the iron stake and then a little chorus of cries. Lenny got up and brought the puppy back and laid it on the hay and sat down. He stroked the pup again. You wasn't big enough, he said. They told me and told me you wasn't. I didn't know you'd get killed so easy. He worked his fingers on the pup's limp ear. Maybe George won't care, he said. This here gosh darn little son of a gun wasn't nothing to George. Curly's wife came around the end of that last stall. She came very quietly so that Lenny didn't see her. She wore her bright cotton dress and the mules with the red ostrich feathers. The mules are referring to her shoes. Her face was made up and the little sausage curls were all in place. She was quite near to him before Lenny looked up and saw her. In a panic, he shoveled hay over the puppy with his fingers. He looked sullenly up at her. If we think about, I'm going to stop right there, sorry. If we think about the emotions that Lenny's going through right now, what is your, think about your take on Lenny and everything that he's feeling and think about his actions. I know we're not talking about um, character development in this one, but what is the conflict? But actually, um, what does this conflict tell us about Lenny? How does it, how does it develop his character? Okay, and now we're switching. Here comes Curly's wife. Oh my goodness. Okay, you should be making some predictions here because we know all along this book, Curly's wife has represented trouble. And whenever she has come into the picture, nothing good has happened. Okay, so let's pick back up here. She said, What you got there, sonny boy? Lenny glared at her. George says, I ain't to have nothing to do with you. Talk to you or nothing. She laughed. George giving you orders about everything? Lenny looked down at the hay. Says I can't tend no rabbits if I talk to you or anything. She said quietly. He scared Curly. Curly will get mad. Well, Curly got his arm in a sling. And if Curly gets tough, you can break his other hand. You didn't put nothing over on me about getting it caught in no machine. But Lenny was not to be drawn. No, sir. I ain't going to talk to you or nothing. She knelt in the hay beside him. Listen, she said. All the guys got a horseshoe tenement going on. It's only about four o'clock. None of them guys is going to leave that tenement. Why can't I talk to you? I never get to talk to nobody. I get awful lonely. Oh, here we go back to being lonely and that loneliness that we've seen reoccurring in this text. I get lonely, she said. You can talk to people, but I can't talk to nobody but Curly, else he gets mad. How'd you like not to talk to anybody? Lenny said, well, I ain't supposed to. George is scared I'll get in trouble. Let's think about this. Okay. And going back to Curly's wife coming into the picture. Okay, maybe this could be an example of foreshadowing here. Okay, she changed the subject. Well, you got covered up there. Then all of Lenny's woe came back on him. Just my pup, he said sadly. Just my little pup. And he swept the hay from on top of it. Why, he's dead, she cried. He was so little, said Lenny. I was just playing with him, and he made like he's going to bite me, and I made like I was going to smack him, and, and I'd done it, and then he was dead. She consoled him. Don't you worry, none. He was just a mutt. You can get another one easy. The whole country is full of mutts. 
It ain't that so much, Lenny explained miserably. George ain't gonna let me tend no rabbits now. Why don't he? Well, he said if I if I done any more bad things, he ain't gonna let me tend the rabbits. She moved closer to him and she spoke soothingly. Don't you worry about talking to me. Listen to the guys yell out there. They got four dollars bet in that tenement. Nothing, none of them ain't gonna leave till it's over. If George sees me talking to you, he'll give me hell, Lenny said cautiously. He told me so. His face grew angry. Her, oh, sorry, her face grew angry. What's the matter with me? She cried. Ain't I got a right to talk to nobody? What do they think I am anyways? You're a nice guy. I don't know why I can't talk to you. I ain't doing no harm to you. Well, George says you'll get us in a mess. Ah, nuts, she said. What kind of harm am I doing to you? Seems like they ain't none of them cares how I gotta live. I tell you, I ain't used to living like this. I could have made something of myself, she said darkly. Maybe I will yet. And then her words tumbled out in a passion of communication as though she hurried before her listener could be taken away. I lived right in Salinas, she said. Come there when I was a kid. Well, a show come through and I met one of the actors. He says I could go with that show, but my old lady wouldn't let me. She says because I was only 15, but the guy says I coulda. If I'd went, I wouldn't be living like this, you bet. Lenny stroked the pup back and forth. We gonna have a little place and rabbits, he explained. She went on with her story quickly before she could be interrupted. Another time I met a guy and he was in pictures. Went out to the Riverside Dance Palace with him. He says he was gonna put me in the movies. Says I was a natural. Soon's he got back to Hollywood, he was gonna write to me about it. She looked closely at Lenny to see whether she was impressing him. I never got that letter, she said. I always thought my old lady stole it. Well, I wasn't going to stay no place where I couldn't get nowhere or make something of myself and where they stole your letters. I asked her if she stole it too, and she says no. So I married Curly. Met him out to the Riverside Dance Palace that same night. She demanded, you listening? Me? Sure. Okay, I want to stop there. In talking about foreshadowing, if we look back at this conversation between her and Lenny, okay, what other examples of foreshadowing might you pick out from this conversation? Okay. Um, also, there are some, even though we're not looking at repetition in this chapter, do you notice things that are being repeated. One, we've got the horseshoes clanking, okay, which was mentioned um, earlier in the chapter as well. We have, again, let me see, where was that? Um, there was another line in here. Um, one, we're talking about the pictures again, being at her being in the movies. We've got loneliness. We have the rabbits again. So all of these examples of repetition that we notice, even when we're not looking for it, things are repeated so frequently in this text that they should start to jump out at you by this, uh, by this point. Okay, um, let's continue. You can pause if you need to make those annotations, and we're going to continue at well. Well, I ain't told this to nobody before. Maybe I oughtn't to. I don't like Curly. He ain't a nice fella. <gasps> she doesn't like her husband? Oh, my. And because she had confided in him, she moved closer to Lenny and sat beside him. Could have been in the movies and had nice clothes, all them nice clothes like they wear. And I could have sat in them big hotels and had pictures took of me. When they had them previews, I could have went to them and spoke in the radio, and it wouldn't have cost me a cent because I was in the picture, and all them nice clothes like they wear. Because this guy says I was a natural. She looked up at Lenny, 
and she made a small grand gesture with her arm and hand to show that she could act. The fingers trailed after her leading wrist, and her little fingers stuck out grandly from the rest. Lenny sighed deeply. From outside came the clang of a horseshoe on metal, and then a chorus of cheers. Somebody made a ringer, said Curly's wife. Now the light was lifting as the sun went down, and the sun streaks climbed up the wall and fell over the feeding racks and over the heads of the horses. Notice how we go from the conversation and then Steinbeck comes back to the setting and refers to like the time of day. Why do you think that this is significant and um, to his writing style and the story? Okay, just think about that. I would even do a quick um, note of your thinking somewhere over here. Okay, I'll continue. Lenny said, Maybe if I took this pup out and throwed him away, George would never know. And then I could tend the rabbits without no trouble. Curly's wife said angrily, Don't you think of nothing but rabbits? We're going to have a little place, Lenny explained patiently. We're going to have a house and a garden and a place for alfalfa. And that alfalfa is for the rabbits. And I take a sack and get it all full of alfalfa, and then I take it to the rabbits. She asked, what makes you so nuts about rabbits? Lenny had to think carefully before he could come to a conclusion. He moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her. I like to pet nice things. Once at a fair, I seen some of them long hair rabbits, and they was nice, you bet. Sometimes I've even pet mice, but not when I could get nothing better. Curly's wife moved away from him a little. I think you're nuts, she said. Who else told Lenny that they think he's nuts? Think about that. Okay, because we have heard that before. Um, something else, right? If you notice the body language here between Lenny and Curly's wife, right? And... First, we have her moving closer to him, confiding in him, so that kind of a, a close distance, right? And now, we have him moving close to her, right? But it says, he moved cautiously close to her until he was right against her. And then he says to her, I like to pet nice things. After he says that, it says, Curly's wife moved away from him a little. Why do you think that that um, kind of creeped her out? Think about that. I would annotate about that too because it is relevant to what we're looking at here in this chapter. Okay. No, I ain't, Lenny explained earnestly. George says I ain't. I like to pest, pet nice things with my fingers, soft things. She was a little bit reassured. Well, who don't, she said. Everybody likes that. I like to feel silk and velvet. Do you like to feel velvet? Lenny chuckled with pleasure. You bet, by gosh, he cried happily. And I had some, too. A lady gave me some, and that lady was my own Aunt Clara. She gave it right to me, about this big a piece. I wished I had that velvet right now. A frown came over his face. I lost it he said. I ain't seen it for a long time. Curly's wife laughed at him. You're nuts, she said, but you're a kind of nice fella, just like a big baby. But a person can see kind of what you mean. When I'm doing my hair sometimes, I just sit and stroke it because it's so soft. To show how she did it, she ran her fingers over the top of her head. Some people got kind of coarse hair, she said complacently. Take Curly. His hair is just like wire, but mine is soft and fine. Of course, I brush it a lot. That makes it fine. Here, feel right here. She took Lenny's hand and put it on her head. Feel right around there and see how soft it is. Lenny's big fingers fell to stroking her hair. Don't you muss it up, she said. Lenny said, oh, that's nice. And he stroked harder. Oh, that's nice. Look out now, you'll muss it. And then she cried angrily. You stop it now, you'll mess it all up. She jerked her head sideways 
and Lenny's fingers closed on her hair and hung on. Let go, she cried. You let go. Lenny was in a panic. His face was contorted. She screamed then, and Lenny's other hand closed over her mouth and nose. Please don't, he begged. Oh, please don't do that. George will be mad. What is happening here? If you think about the other times Lenny has gotten in trouble, think about what happened. What set him off to then have things go badly very quickly? Okay. I would make some annotations here regarding those responses as well. She struggled violently under his hands. Her feet battered on the hay and she writhed to be free. And from under Lenny's hand came a muffled screaming. Lenny began to cry with fright. Oh, please don't do none of that, he begged. George going to say I've done a bad thing. He ain't going to let me tend no rabbits. He moved his hand a little and her hoarse cry came out. Then Lenny grew angry. Now don't, he said. I don't want you to yell. You're going to get me in trouble just like George says you will. Now don't you do that. Okay, again, that foreshadowing. So if you think back to other places in the text, not just chapter five, but in the text overall, where George references that he, she's going to get him in trouble, those are going to be examples you want to um, go through and find. Okay. Um, and she continued to struggle and her eyes were wild with terror. He shook her then and he was angry with her. Don't you go yelling, he said, and he shook her and her body flopped like a fish. And then she was still for Lenny had broken her neck. So now what has Lenny done? Where do we see all the incidents in this book? leading up to how did they foreshadow this he looked down at her and carefully he removed his hand from over her mouth and she lay still so what has happened to curly's wife i don't want to hurt you he said but george will be mad if you yell when she didn't answer nor move he bent closely over her he lifted her arm and let it drop. For a moment, he seemed bewildered. And then he whispered in fright, I'd done a bad thing. I'd done another bad thing. He pawed up the hay until it partly covered her. When you imagine Lenny pawing up the hay, think about what that looks like and what, what um, animal is this characteristic of? From outside the barn came a cry of men and the double clang of shoes on metal. For the first time, Lenny became conscious of the outside. He crouched down in the hay and listened. I'd done a real bad thing, he said. I shouldn't have did that. George will be mad and, he said, and hide in the brush till he come. He's going to be mad in the brush till he come. That's what he said. Lenny went back and looked at the dead girl. The puppy lay close to her. Lenny picked it up. I'll throw him away, he said. It's bad enough like it is. He put the pup under his coat and he crept to the barn wall and peered out between the cracks toward the horseshoe game. And then he crept around the end of the last manger and disappeared. The sun streaks were high on the wall by now and the light was growing soft in the barn. Curly's wife lay on her back and she was half covered with hay. Now, why do you think that Lenny chose to take the puppy and leave the girl? He says, um, it's bad enough like it is. But think about that choice to take the puppy versus Curly's wife. Okay. And here again, we have reference right after this whole incident of Curly's wife being killed. Now again, he refers back to the the time of day and the description of the light so obviously the light is significant why is it significant okay make annotations and you can pause the video and then continue it was very quiet in the barn and the quiet of the afternoon was on the ranch even the clang of the pit shoes 
Even the voices of the men in the game seemed to grow more quiet. The air in the barn was dus dusky in advance of the outside day. A pigeon flew in through the open hay door and circled and flew out again. Around the last stall came a shepherd dog, lean and long, with heavy hanging dugs. Halfway to the packing box where the puppy puppies were, she caught the dead scent of Curly's wife, and the hair rose along her spine. She whimpered and cringed to the packing box and jumped in among the puppies. Curly's wife lay with a half covering of yellow hay, and the meanness and the planning and the discontent and the ache for attention were all gone from her face. She was very pretty and simple, and her face was sweet and young. Now her rouged lips, her rouged cheeks, and her reddened lips made her seem alive and sleeping very lightly. The curls, tiny little sausages, were spread on the hay behind her head, and the lip and her lips were parted. As happened sometimes, a moment settled and hovered and remained for much more than a moment, and sound stopped and movement stopped for much, much more than a moment. If you look at Steinbeck's description of Curly's wife here in the um, the next to the last paragraph that I read. Think about how he describes her in death versus how he described her in life. Okay, I'm going to continue. Then gradually time awakened again and moved sluggishly on. The horses stamped on the other side of the feeding racks and the halter chains clinked. There again we have the clinking halter chains. Outside the men's voices became louder and clearer. From around the end of the last stall, old Candy's voice came. Lenny, he called. Oh, Lenny, you in here? I've been figuring some more. Tell you what we can do, Lenny. Old Candy appeared around the end of the last stall. Oh, Lenny, he called again, and then he stopped, and his body stiffened. He rubbed his smooth wrist on his white stubble whiskers. I didn't know you was here, he said to Curly's wife. When she didn't answer, he stepped near. You wantin' to you wantin' to sleep out here, he said disapprovingly, and then he was beside her and Oh no He looked about helplessly and he rubbed his beard, and then he jumped up and went quickly out of the barn. But the barn was alive now, the horses stamped and snorted, and they chewed the straw of their bedding and they clashed the chains of their halters. In a moment, Candy came back and George was with him. George said, Why, What was it you wanted to see me about? Candy pointed at Curly's wife. George stared. What's the matter with her? He asked. He stepped closer and then he echoed Candy's words. Oh, no! He was down on his knees beside her. He put his hand over her heart and finally, when he stood up, slowly and stiffly, his face was as hard and tight as wood, and his eyes were hard. Candy said, What done it? George looked coldly at him. Ain't you got any ideas? He asked, and Candy was silent. I should have knew, George said hopelessly. I guess maybe way back in my head, I did. Candy asked, What are we gonna do now, George? What are we gonna do now? George was a long time in answering. Guess we got to tell the guys. I guess we got to get them and lock them up. We can't let them get away. Why, the poor guy'd starve. And he tried to reassure himself. Maybe they'll lock him up and be nice to him. So what do you think is, um, one, the, the conflict here? Um, that we're maybe we're not seeing yet or that could be developing and then if you think about the look at this conversation between George and Candy what do they say and what do they not say what words never come out of their mouth okay but Candy said excitedly we ought to let him get away you don't know that Curly Curly gonna want to get him lynched Curly will get him killed. George watched Candy's lips. Yeah, he said at last. That's right. Curly will, and the other guys will. And he looked back at Curly's wife. Now Candy spoke his greatest fear. 
You and me can get that little place, can't we, George? You and me can go there and live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? Before George answered, Candy dropped his head and looked down at the hay. He knew. George said softly, I think I knowed from the very first. I think I knowed we'd never do her. He used to like to hear about it so much, I got to thinking maybe we would. Okay, if we talk, if we look at this, right, and think about Candy, it says, now Candy spoke his greatest fear. What was Candy's greatest fear and why? And then when we go to George said softly, and he references, I think I knowed we'd never do her. What is the her that they're referring to? And why is it a her? So I would make some annotations about that, right? And and we do, and what we can look at with foreshadowing, if we go back through other times that they talked about land with Candy in chapter three, and where he's telling him all about it and everything, we will be able to find examples of foreshadowing there, okay? And then um, kind of within this passage here, we can look at these examples and how everything else led up to here, okay? All right, then it's all off, Candy asked sulkily. George didn't answer his question. George said, I'll work my month and I'll take my 50 bucks and I'll stay all night in some lousy cat house, or I'll sit in some pool room till everybody gets home, and then I'll come back and work another month, and I'll have 50 bucks more. Candy said, he's such a nice fella. I didn't think he'd do nothing like this. Okay, and if you think, too, back to Curly's wife, and what she said to to um, Lenny right before he killed her, that he's a nice fella, that she can tell he's a nice fella. Um, so I thought that was, um, throughout the book, we have reference to Lenny being a nice fella. So what do you think about Lenny now? Right. Um, another thing that you should, um, think about too, is why didn't George answer Candy? Why do you think he did not respond to that question? Okay. George still stared at Curly's wife. Lenny never done it in meanness, he said. All the time he done bad things, but he never done one of them mean. He straightened up and looked back at Candy. Now listen, we gotta tell the guys. They gotta bring him in, I guess. They ain't no way out. Maybe they won't hurt him, he said sharply. I ain't gonna let them hurt Lenny. Now you listen. The guys might think I was in on it. I'm gonna go in the bunkhouse. Then in a minute, you come out and tell the guys about her. And I'll come along and make like I never seen her. Will you do that so the guys won't think I was in on it? Candy said, sure, George. Sure, I'll do that. Okay, give me a couple of minutes then. And you come running out and tell like you just found her. I'm going now. George turned and went quickly out of the barn. Old Candy watched him go. He looked helplessly back at Curly's wife. And gradually his sorrow and his anger grew into words. You gosh darn tramp, he said viciously. You done it, didn't you? I suppose you're glad. Everybody knowed you'd mess things up. You wasn't no good. You ain't no good now, you lousy tart. He sniveled and his voice shook. I could have hoed in the garden and washed dishes for, dishes for them guys. He paused and then went on in a sing song and he repeated the old words. If they was a circus or a baseball game, we would have went to her. Just said to hell with work and went to her. Never asked nobody say so. And they'd have been a pig and chickens and in the winter, the little fat stove and the rain coming and us just sitting there. His eyes blinded with tears and he turned and went weakly out of the barn and he rubbed his bristly whiskers with his wrist stump. Outside the house of the ga outside the noise of the game stopped. There was a rise of voices in question. A drum of running feet and the men burst in the barn, Slim and Carlson and Young Wit and Curly, and Crooks keeping back out of attention range. Candy came after them, and last of all came George. George had put on his blue denim coat and buttoned it, 
and his black hat was pulled down low over his eyes. The men raced around the last stall. Their eyes found Curly's wife in the gloom. They stopped and stood still and looked. Then Slim went quietly over to her, and he felt her wrist. One lean finger touched her cheek, and then his hand went under her slightly twisted neck, and his fingers explored her neck. When he stood up, the men crowded near, and the spell was broken. Curly came suddenly to life. I know who done it, he cried. That big son of a gun done it. I know he done it. Why, everybody else was out there playing horseshoes. He worked himself into a fury. I'm going to get him. I'm going for my shotgun. I'll kill the big son of a gun myself. I'll shoot him in the guts. Come on, guys. He ran furiously out of the barn. Carlson said, I'll get my Luger, and he ran out too. Slim turned quietly to George. I guess Lenny done it all right, he said. Her neck's bust. Lenny could have did that. George didn't answer, but he nodded slowly. His hat was so far down on his forehead that his eyes were covered. Slim went on. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Maybe like that time in weed you was telling about. Again, George nodded. Slim sighed. Well, I guess we gotta go get him. Where you think you might have went? It seemed to take George some time to free his words. He would have went south, he said. We come from north, so he would have went south. I guess we gotta get him, Slim repeated. George stepped close. Couldn't we maybe bring him in and they'll lock him up? He's nuts, Slim. He never done this to be mean. Slim nodded. We might, he said. If we could keep Curly in, we might. But Curly's going to want to shoot him. Curly's still mad about his hand. And suppose they lock him up and strap him down and put him in a cage. That ain't no good, George. I know, said George. I know. Carlson came running in. The bastard stole my luger, he shouted. It ain't in my bag. Curly followed him. And Curly carried a shotgun in his good hand. Curly was cold now. All right, you guys, he said. The guy, uh, Crooks has got a shotgun. You take it, Carlson. When you see it, um, don't give him no chance. Shoot for his guts. That'll double him over. Wit said excitedly, I ain't got a gun. Curly said, you go in Soledad and get a cop. Get Al Wiltz. He's deputy sheriff. Let's go now. He turned suspiciously on George. You're coming with us, fella. Yeah, said George. I'll come. But listen, Curly, the poor guy's nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't know what he was doing. Don't shoot him, Curly cried. He got Carlson's Luger. Of course we'll shoot him, George said weakly. Maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim stood looking down at Curly's wife. He said, Curly, maybe you better stay here with your wife. Curly's face reddened. I'm going, he said. I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big guy myself. Even if I only got one hand, I'm going to get him. Slim turned to Candy. You stay here with her then, Candy. The rest of us better get going. They moved away. George stopped a moment beside Candy, and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curly called, You, George, you stick with us so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly after them, and his feet dragged heavily. And when they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor, poor girl, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually, and in their stalls the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy lay down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arm. Okay, and that is the end of chapter five. Go back through in these, um, these last couple of pages. We do see other hints at conflicts that aren't explicit. Uh, they're not explicitly stated, but we can tell these characters, different characters, are going through things. So make annotations about those um, conflicts, anything else about foreshadowing. And then for theme, think about the topics that we've talked about. Think about the reoccurring topics that have come up in this chapter and make some predictions about what the theme, which is the overall message, could be for the book of Mice and Men.